Now, he says in verse 17, and I'm going to read now from my translation, Thou sayest, I am rich. Now, the city of Laodicea was a rich city. I suppose Laodicea and Sardis were probably two of the richest cities in that entire area at that particular time. Now he says, Thou sayest I am rich, and have gotten riches, and have need of nothing. (laughs) They believe that the dollar was the answer to every problem of life. And after World War II, that is the assumption that our government was run on. All we did was dole out dollars all over the world, and we thought we'd buy friends, make peace, and settle the problems of the world. And very frankly, I believe that our nation has probably complicated the world more than anything else. China's in the condition it's in because of our meddling. And Germany divided as it was divided. And the problem down in Israel today, the Middle East, that has all been the making of a nation that's been sticking its nose in everybody's business and not tending to our own business. And as a result, we thought that the dollar, all we have to do is allocate money and we solve the problems of the world. My friend, riches never solved any problem. This church in Laodicea tried it. I am rich, have gotten riches, and had need of nothing. And thou dost not know that thou art the wretched one, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Now, this church made its boast of material possessions. Conversely, the church in Smyrna was poor in material things. You remember the Lord Jesus commended them for that. It was a church of slaves and poor folk. There were not many rich and not many noble in the early church. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now the present-day church boasts of large membership, prominent people, huge attendance, generous giving, and ornate buildings. That's the thing that we boast of in this day. And I have figures here that tell a frightful story in one way. And I'm giving now a quotation from an article by Mr. Percy in Moody Monthly several years ago. He says, "...a phenomenal growth in membership from 20% of our population in 1884 to 35% of the population in 1959. That was the height, by the way. 61 million Protestant church members would indicate the possibility of a church on fire for God. And there are other indications. Wealth beyond the wildest dreams of our forefathers an income of $5 billion in 1959, a building program that will see $800 million spent for new church structures, mass evangelistic meetings attended by tens of thousands, use of other mass media such as radio and literature increasing constantly. Now, that's the end of the quotation. And now, will you listen to this? Worldly wealth is the measuring rod for the modern church. Spiritual values have been lost sight of or entirely ignored. The church is not only rich in earthly goods, but it actually is in the business of accumulating wealth. People are urged to make their wills in favor of so-called Christian organizations, radio programs, and other professing Christian works are operated as promotional schemes to raise money to provide luxurious care for the promoters. And friends, you ought to check how your money is being spent that you give to Christian work. And may I say this, that you ought to make sure that if you leave in your will, and I hope you will leave in your will, money for Christian work, but you're going to make sure that after you're gone, it's going to be spent just for that very thing. Now, may I say to you on the spiritual side of the ledger, 
The Laodicean church is the wretched one. It's worse off than any other, the seven churches. It's to be pitied because it's spiritually poverty-stricken. In it is no study of the Word, no love of Christ, no witnessing of His saving grace. Yet it's blind to its own true condition. It lacks the covering of the robe of righteousness. Now let me give you a picture today. A pastor over in Arlington, Virginia, back in 1967, wrote this. I guess it was in his bulletin. I'd like to pass this on. He sends an open letter to Jane Ordinary. And he says, Dear Jane, I'm writing to help you shake this feeling of uselessness that has overtaken you. Several times you've said that you don't see how Christ can possibly use you. You're nobody special. The church must bear part of the responsibility for making you feel as you do. I have in mind the success story mentality of the church. Our church periodicals tell the story of John J. Moneybags, who uses his influential position to witness for Christ. At the church youth banquet, we have a testimony from All-American football star Ox Kikovsky, who commands the respect of his teammates when he witnesses for Christ. We'd led to think that if you don't have the leverage of stardom or a big position in the business world, you might as well keep your mouth shut. Nobody cares what Christ has done for you. We've forgotten an elementary fact about Christian witness, something that should encourage you. God has chosen what the world calls foolish to shame the wise. He has chosen what the world calls weak to shame the strong. He has chosen things of little strength and small repute, yes, and even things which have no real existence to explode the pretensions of the things that are, that no man may boast in the presence of God. When Jesus Christ chose his disciples, he didn't choose Olympic champs or Roman senators. He chose simple people like you. Some were fishermen. One as a political extremist. Another was a publican, a nobody in that society. But these men turned the Roman world upside down for Christ. How did they do it? Through their popularity? They had none. Their position? They had none. Their power was the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Jane, don't forget that we still need the ordinary in the hands of Christ to turn the world upside down. You see, friends, that we in the church sing, the church is one foundation, it's Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride with his own blood. He bought her and for his life he died. And yet it's true that inscription that's on the cathedral at Lubeck, Germany, and it goes like this. Thus speaketh Christ our Lord to us. Ye call me master and obey me not. Ye call me light and see me not. Ye call me way and walk me not. Ye call me life and choose me not. Ye call me wise and follow me not. Ye call me fair and love me not. Ye call me rich and ask me not. Ye call me eternal and seek me not. Ye call me noble and serve me not. Ye call me gracious and trust me not. Ye call me might and honor me not. Ye call me just and fear me not. If I condemn you, blame me not. This is the church in Laodicea. This is the church that Stanley High made the statement several years ago. He says, The church has failed to tell me that I'm a sinner. The church has failed to deal with me as a lost individual. He says the church has failed to offer me salvation in Jesus Christ alone. The church has failed to tell me of the horrible consequences of sin, the certainty of hell, and the fact that Jesus Christ alone can save. He went on to add, we need more of the last judgment and less of the golden rule. 
more of a living God and a living devil as well, more of a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. The church must bring to me a message not of cultivation, but of rebirth. I might fail that kind of a church, but that kind of church would not fail me. My friend, we're living in the Laodicean period today, and the church is failing to witness to the saving grace of God 